Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to today's Kendall Run. Uh, let's get straight into it. Um, I missed this question from uh, a couple of days ago and I really want to uh, answer it because I think it's a really good one. It says, Hi Andy, could you please briefly explain the concept of yuko da totsu? Yuko da totsu. Yuko da totsu means a correct or a valid strike. And essentially, um, I did do a video about this going in depth, so definitely check that out. It's on the Kendo Show uh, channel. Um, just search yuko da totsu and it'll come up. Um, and there's also a great article over at Kendall kench247.net, kench247 that is, kench247.net, it's a great um, website um, and there's, a, there's a, a diagram on there which I'll go through in a minute and there's, I think there's a link to the video that I did, um, so if you search that as well, you'll definitely get a great a idea. Uh, now to quickly gloss over it, now it's a massively deep uh, subject, uh, but basically you, you call that otter, it means a valid strike. Uh, and it says here as well, brackets, kikentai no ichi. Um, now we often think of kikentai no ichi as a, a spirit, sword, body uh, as one. That's what it means. Uh, but we often think of that as like the stamping, the hitting and the shouting all doing it together. But it's actually quite a little bit more than that. Um, in, in the, it encompasses the whole... Uh, that sort of everything in Yuko Datotsu is part of kikentai no ichi. Um, so... It splits it into two things at the top right away. The first one being the DI, rationale, so the reason for being. And it's talking about actually the seikaku na datotsu, which means essentially um, the correct strike. And uh, so it, it's talking first about the, the actual striking, okay? And then over here, it's talking about zanshin, okay? So what happens sort of before and after the strike. Um, so, coming back over to the, uh, the DI, the rationale of the actual strike, we've got the components, um, and these are all things that, that the strike has to have in order to be considered yuko datotsu. It has to be a good uh, mai, the good distance, uh, the good opportunity, um, you have to have the correct body movement, you have to have the correct use of the hands, a good application of tenochi, and you also have to have the uh, tsuyosato sai. Uh, power and power and crispness it says here um, so yeah it has to have that kind of it has to be strong but it has to be sharp and it kind of snap um, so they're kind of physical components and the re requisites you have to have a good um, posture good shise it's called good posture the good kise which means like the good um, spirit like kind of be, have a good voice it says underneath as well has say like the shouting Datotsubui, uh, datotsubui, so hitting the correct area, um, and then shinai no shinai shinai no datotsubu, shinai no datotsubu. That means the actual correct striking area on the shinai. Yeah, you have to hit with the correct part of the shinai, not down here. Um, and then the last one says hasuji, hasuji. So the correct angle of the blade when you actually strike. Um, they're all sort of physical parts of the of the actual strike. That have to happen and then also has to be zanshin kamae and that breaks down into uh, kigamae which is the spiritual awareness the kind of mental awareness or readiness and then the migamae the kamae of the body so the physical stance and the physical posture has to be correct and what I love about this diagram is at the bottom as well, it kind of shows you how the yuko datotsu can be judged. Um, it says in the middle, keiken, which is experience, so the experience of a, a referee. Um, this is what referees would use to award yuko datotsu or not. Next to that, there's the mede miru, so what you can see, what you can actually see, and it kind of draws off lines to parts of what you can, you know, what parts of the, the diagram can be judged with the eyes. And then mimi de kiku, so what you can hear. So then it draws as well to like what you can uh, recognize from hearing. Okay, so check out that. That's a great diagram. It's over at kench247.net. Um, check out the video that I did and it'll give you a sort of idea of what the term and concept of Yuko Tatotsu is all about. Um, it's, it, I very much glossed over it, so check out the video because I've, uh, I've gone into a bit more depth with that, <laughs> okay? Um, right, uh, next one. Right, uh, how do you turn a bad stamping fumikomi into a, a flat-footed slapping fumikomi? I have high arches and I feel like an impossibility to get that slap without the stamp. Uh, right, there's two things I'd say about that. First is um, don't worry about making a loud 
sort of noise with this with the stamp uh, or the slap or whatever don't worry about the noise too much all right um just try and do it correctly and the noise will come later secondly uh, that sort of thing happens because you're carrying too much of your weight sort of distributed over your right leg over your front foot when it really needs to be uh, carried almost entirely by your left leg as you push forward um, and almost none of your weight is distributed over your right leg until the last bam at the last minute um, if your weight's distributed a little bit too much over your front leg so you're kind of going forward and your weight's leaning forward slightly that's when you get this kind of stamping like you're talking about but if your weight's kind of a little bit uh, more distributed over your left leg your left leg is carrying your body weight as you push forward bam you can make that uh, that stamp in a much more dynamic way and then what you have to do is the minute that right foot lands you use your right thigh okay so you're pushing off with your left calf uh, it's an action called fumikiri uh, that's the kind of secret to the fumikomi and pushing off with that right calf as you push forward the right foot hits the floor and the minute it hits the floor you engage your right thigh to pull your left foot back up straight under uh, straight after it and then move off quickly okay um so that's the that that's the sort of thing with that it's going to take a lot of practice though it's not going to be like that and fixed unfortunately um <clears throat> okay uh hi andy thanks for the videos they're really cool insight into the everyday things in kendall uh and also not so everyday things good uh thank you i'm, I'm glad you uh, i'm glad you enjoy them uh i am new to kendall it's my seven seventh ish month now uh, and soon I'll intend my first one hour Jigeko session. I only ever had one little two minute, uh, sorry, I only ha ever had a little two minute Jigeko practice and it was quite confusing. Do you have any hints or tips as to what to focus on during Jigeko as a beginner? Right, uh, this is a great question because I think it comes up a lot. I think a lot of beginners get quite confused as to what they should do in Jigeko. Right, in Jigeko, what you should be doing is, uh, Jigeko is a type of keiko, that's why it's called Jigeko. Uh, and you're trying to improve your kendo, you're not just trying to compete. Now, of course, there's a competitive aspect, but it's through that comp competitive aspect that you are able to improve. Now, what you have to do is, especially if you're practicing with people that are senior to you, um, you have to try not to let your emotions overtake um, your actions. Um, so try and stay calm, but also, Try and stay proactive, make sure that you are assertive and that you're attacking, um, like I say, proactively, but not randomly, okay? Um, make sure that you are attacking in your own time, but with your own, with, uh, like I say, with a proactive spirit. And when you do attack, make sure you give everything to each attack and you're not doing any sort of half-hearted attacks, okay? Uh, it's not about hitting, just hitting the target. It's about achieving you call that otsu. Okay, it's about achieving you kodato. So that's what Jigeko is. Jigeko is the uh, the practice of trying to achieve you kodato while someone else is trying to do the same. Okay, that's the idea. It's not it's not a uh, a competition to see who can hit the other person's bogo as much as possible. Okay, um, so other than that, uh, just uh, relax, be proactive, and do your best and give everything to each attack. Okay, um, <clears throat> and the rest will come with experience. I'm afraid. <laughs> Right, next one. Um, this one came to me by Facebook message and I think it's a great question. It says, um, can you help me find things to do to train uh, that don't lose too much ground if I break my ankle? Yes, okay, no problem. Um, right, when my younger, uh, older daughter started Kendall at the first club that she started at, um, there was a girl in her group um, who also, she was a bit older, um, she would have been about 12 at the time, 11 or 12 at the time, uh, she broke her ankle. And uh, she was very into Kendall though, she was very keen to get better. So she still came to the dojo every session, uh, it was three times a week at that club. Um, and she'd come and she'd put on her Kendogi and Hakama and she'd sit in a chair in the corner of the dojo, uh, wearing the Dogi and Hakama. And she'd have her Shinai sat in the chair and she'd spend the whole two hours practicing Saburi. Practicing Saburi, okay? Um, and every now and again, Sensei would come over and check that she's doing the correct sabudi. Um, and every now and again, she'd need to she need to take a little break because she'd be she'd be covered in sweat from doing the sabudi. She'd be trying her hardest to do it. Um, 
and uh, every now and again she'd take a little break but while she was taking that break she'd make a point to watch the other practice and get an idea of what they were practicing and make sure that she was understanding what they were doing um, and training her eyes for Kendall kind of doing Mitori Yeko as well okay so um, I've done a video about how you can practice at home um, sometimes without footwork you know if you've got a low ceiling you can sit in a chair practice sabudi um, and if you can get down to the dojo uh, and do it, I think that's a great thing because then you can get your, your teacher's feedback and you can still interact with everybody and can still find out what everybody's uh, doing and kind of learn that way as well. Okay, so that's my, uh, my feedback there. Uh, next one. Um, this, was a, this is based off a, it's not a direct question, but we, we were, there was a, a, a question that came up on, face, on the Facebook uh, Early Access group. Uh, there's a link to it in the description, so uh, if you're not in it, get in it. Um, the, uh, um, about the membuchi, okay? Um, and I want to talk about the membuchi because uh, it, it kind of comes up a lot. Um, I, I often, not often, but I occasionally get an email about it, um, being a borger retailer. Uh, and I think it's something that, obviously, when, especially when you buy your first borger, you're not so aware of. Now, the membuchi is this part of the men here, this hard part that's black and red um, it connects the cage to the futon now this is painted with a synthetic uh, urushi lacquer it's not real urushi uh, some places use real urushi but like uh, that's pretty much stopped now because real urushi tends to chip off really easily um, the only way to get it so it doesn't chip off really easily is like put like six or seven coats on which takes about three or four months and nowhere does that nowhere is doing that so um, and the other problem with real Udushi is it's, it's, it's quite highly poisonous as well. Um, so um, most places use this. It's called cashew. It's a kind of um, synthetic Udushi that's made from the oil of cashew nuts. And um, it, it, it looks very similar, um, but it's much more durable. It takes to the member too much better. And it tends to last longer and it doesn't take as long um, to, to, to apply. So... Um, that's that's what it is. Now, what the question I often get about is when this chips off. Now, as you can see, this one has started to chip away. I've only used this men a handful of times because uh, I've got I've got loads of borgu, as you can probably imagine. <laughs> um, and this is this is my victory borgu. Uh, I love this borgu, um, but I don't use it that much because it is more of a kind of tournament style borgu. Um, and I've I've got I've actually got two tournament borgu sets, even though I don't do that many tournaments. At the moment um, <laughs> but uh, it is still a great set and it, I, I do wear it uh, occasionally uh, but as you can see it started to chip away now um, if you take something and then you paint it um, with lacquer it doesn't matter what kind of lacquer you paint it with and then you take a stick and you repeatedly beat it with the stick of course that paint's gonna chip off all right um, it's natural now I know some people, they see it happen and think, oh no, my men is defective. It's not defective. It's natural. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of part of the process. It happens to everybody. Now, because this is made of rawhide, this, this is, uh, this member is made of rawhide. It's like, it's a kind of dried animal hide. Um, each one is different. Some of it takes to it better, some not quite as well. Um, so sometimes it chips off faster, sometimes it takes longer to chip off, but it generally always chips off, okay? Um, and it's not a major thing, it's not a big problem, doesn't mean the men's defective, it won't really affect the, the life, uh, lifespan of the men, um, it, it's just a cosmetic thing, frankly. Um, even some of the really cheap burger sets you get in Japan for little kids, they don't even bother to paint it. Um, so it's, it's not such a massive thing. Um, now, one of the things that somebody did write um, was, about treating this because you could tell it was like a leather product um, and putting oil on it. Now I did write on there, just you must not do that, okay? Do not put oil or any moisture on this member chi, okay? Because this, this is a dried out piece of animal hide. If it gets wet, it'll go soft. And the last thing you want it to do is go soft because what'll happen is it'll cave in here, the mangani might shift a bit and it might tear. And you see this a lot um, up here at this point where it intersects with the mangani, the tatagani here. Um, Sometimes you see it rip here. And that happens usually through kind of not looking after the men properly. And I say not looking after it properly, most of us don't know how to do it. A lot of people, um, the first thing you've got to do when you get home from Kendall is you take your burger out of the burger bag. It must come out of the burger bag, right? 
that's number one. <laughs> Two, you have to leave it somewhere nice to dry, okay? Preferably not in the direct sun if you, if you don't want it to fade. Um, and basically, what a lot of people do, because the uchiwa, this part inside here, this part inside here, tends to get wet because it's got our face against it and we sweat on it, they'll, they'll leave it somewhere like this, face down, to dry. So we want to get as much air to this. Problem is, is because of this, gravity pulls all the sweat that's in the futon down into the membrane, and that's when this starts to crack. Yeah, so this isn't the best way to wear, uh, leave it. You don't want to leave it like this. If anything, you want to leave it face up like this. It might take a little bit longer to dry uh, than leaving it like this, but you're going to protect the membrane. The very best thing you can do is get the hemo, get the hemo, and hang it up like this. This is the best way to leave it to dry. Yeah, because it'll dry out nice and quickly, and the membrane won't get wet from the uh, from the sweat that's in the futon. Okay, so um, that's uh, that's my sort of thing on that. But if you if you get a men and the membrane, the the lacquer starts to chip away, don't panic. It's not that it's defective. It's just a normal thing that happens. Okay, it can be easily be, it can easily be repainted. Um, if you're in Europe, uh, there's like a product called Hammerite, I think it is. Um, it's like you can get it from the hardware store, like I think they use it to paint like railings and gates and stuff like that. It's an oil-based lacquer basically, um, like a gloss black oil-based lacquer. Uh, I think there's a similar thing called Rust-Oleum or something out in the US or something, I'm not sure. Um, I heard about it. <laughs> uh, but so anything like that, um, it'll be absolutely fine to do it. Some people even use marker pens, but it, it doesn't look that good. I, I think it'd look better just a bit chipped away. Nobody cares about it, do you know what I mean? Like in Japan, most people just don't, even notice whether it's chipped or not because they just don't pay it that much attention. Um, okay, next question. Uh, another one from the early access group. Uh, my question is open to anyone who can offer any advice. I'm a beginner in kendo. I'm lucky to attend a dojo that has a skilled sensei and students with high level visiting students. But when practicing, I've been struggling with my own stamina and energy and been feeling very tired at practice. Is there an exercise that anyone can recommend I can do at home in the gym or between practice to help? Okay, <laughs> this is somebody. Every, this is something pretty much everybody experiences, right? You could take the fittest, like athlete in the world, throw them into Borgo, put them into an hour's kendo practice, and I'm sure they're going to be tired out afterwards. I'm sure of it, right? Because t kendo uh, tires you out in a different way, and um, and especially especially when you're new and you're not sort of used to it. Um. Frankly, there's not a lot you can do. General fitness stuff, yeah, someone's commented about general fitness stuff, you can run in and stuff like that might help. Um, but otherwise, it's gonna be just a case of you're gonna get fitter for doing Kendall by doing Kendall. Um, and I think it will get better with time. Um, other than that, the other two things you can do is make sure that you're eating well. And secondly, more, and more importantly, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Um, you will find a difference with that, all right? Try and drink as much water as you can before practice. Uh, drink during practice if you get chance, but definitely before and definitely afterwards. Um, but I think if you're making sure you're uh, hydrating yourself uh, properly, then uh, you'll definitely uh, feel the benefit of that. Um, next one. Hi, Andy. I have a question about uh, Kendogi and Borgu. Are there colours... Not, are there any colours that are not permitted to wear and what reason why and what character symbols are not allowed on the tare? Okay, uh, right. <laughs> um, right, the kendogi, uh, the kendogi and the borgu are generally navy blue. Uh, sometimes they're white. Um, you can get different coloured kendogi and hakama, uh, but I wouldn't if I were you. Um, it, isn't, it just isn't... Um, part of the dress code. Um, most Shi'ai in Japan will not let you wear different coloured hakama and kendogi. Um, so, uh, the reason we wear navy blue is because that's a traditional colour. Apparently from the days of the samurai, they would wear aizome uh, dyed, the indigo dyed, traditional indigo dyed fabric uh, because it's anti, uh, what is it, antiseptic or something? Like it's, an, it's deodorant and it's antiseptic and it's good. It's good if you get injured, basically, and it tends not to stink as much. Um, though I think my wife would disagree with my kendogi. But uh, <laughs> but um, essentially, it, it's like it was good for warriors because it ha it, it was thought it's thought to have like some healing properties. Um, and like I say, um, 
because it, it, it's tend to be sort of antibacterial naturally. Um, so that's why we use the, um, the navy blue. That's why that, where that tradition came from. Um, in terms of uh, characters and symbols not allowed on the Tade. Okay, I think you're talking about the Zekken or the Tade name or the, the proper name is the Nafuda, which is the current name for it, the Nafuda. Uh, I hate the word. I hate using the word nafuda for it. In my word, in my world, it's a zekken or a tari name. But uh, <laughs> I'll get told off now by the Old Japan Kendo Federation for saying that. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, the zekken um, is um, it's a name tag. All right, so you write your name on it. That's the characters that are on it. You don't write just a thing you like or something, you write, you write your name and the dojo name so people know who you are, okay? Uh, and a, a point of uh, trivia, um, you should try and get one of those as soon as possible, as soon as you start wearing a borgo because it's, uh, it's considered bad manners to not wear one. Um, yeah, going back to the, going back to, the, I'm going to rant again here. This is just my own rant now, but about the the Zekken. I don't like the term Nafuda because I know someone's going to put in the co comments the pro the proper words Nafuda. You should call it Nafuda. Um, I don't like the word Nafuda. It is the proper word. They don't like you using. Uh, there was a thing the All Japan Kendo Federation came out with. They don't like us using. Uh, they don't want people to use loan words too much. Um, in. Uh, in kendo, they want to keep the Japanese culture um, and by keep it like kind of strong Japanese culture by re retaining the Japanese words for things. So that's why, and also things that make it sound like a sport. Um, so they wanted us to stop using the word uh, like a, they. I mean, most people say shiaijo outside of Japan, but in Japan, most people, not most, but lots of people don't say shiaijo, they say court. So they say court one, court two, court three, whereas it should be shiaijo one or two. Um, but the term, like uh, one of the things that they, they don't want us to say borgo either. Uh, they wanted us to say kendogo, um, which is uh, apparently the official, official thing. It should be kendogo, but uh, everybody says borgo. Everybody says borgo. The problem with the word kendogo is it's too vague um, because it can mean, it, it can mean any, the shinai is part of the kendogo, technically. It mean, kendogo literally means kendo equipment. Um, I think some people might say, oh yeah, but you should call the bo it shouldn't be called borgo, it should be dogo. And it's because the, the word borgo is, it means protective equipment. Um, and I think it's probably used in other sports as well, like boxing or karate or something. Um, for like the protective gear, um, but the the zekken one particularly, I have a thing about because uh, zekken is a is a loan word. It's from a German word. Um, I I can't I can't speak any German or pronounce it. But I was in Germany a few few months ago uh, with my friends at uh, Yoshinjuku in Berlin, and um, I was talking about that. And uh, I think the word is uh, decken or something is a is a, a German word that it comes from. Um, which is like a name cloth. I don't know, I can't remember the exact thing, but uh, that's what Zekken comes from. And uh, the other word that's more common in Japan, people don't tend to use the word Zekken in Japan. They tend to use the word, uh, they tend to call it Tarenemu, Tarenemu, or Taren, tare, tare name, Tarenemu. Uh, but they don't like that, they want to say Nafuda, which is the Japanese, original Japanese word for name label. Um, but like, I, I have two kids and I remember them going to school and they have to wear a name badge and that's called a nafuda and it kind of always just reminded me of like the little kids wearing the little name badge uh, so that's why I can't get used to calling it nafuda <laughs> so um, I think that, what was the other one they don't like you saying tasuki tasuki for the for the ribbon um, either I think they want you to call it me, me, mejirushi mejirushi something like that mejirushi I think it is um, so yeah, that is a, that's a terminology thing that they wanted to kind of clamp down on and it never really took off. Uh, nobody's really changed what they're saying. So uh, with that, I've, uh, I've had my rant of the day. <laughs> um, I think I've covered all of the questions. Uh, leave me a new one down below. Let me know what you'd uh, like me to rant on next time. If there's something bugging you, something you want to know more about, leave a comment down below. Uh, don't forget to like and share and um, subscribe to The Kendo Show. Um, I do have a new episode coming very soon um, about Ojiwaza. The next one's going to be about Ojiwaza. It's a follow-up to our um, recent episode on Dibanawaza. 
so yeah, definitely make sure you're subscribed. Get in the Kendo Show Early Access group because it will be there before it's anywhere else. I do read all the comments in there. I respond to a lot of them on there as well. And that's where I get a lot of the co uh, sorry questions for the Kendo rants. Um, finally, don't forget to do your shopping at Kendo Star. Um, it's fantastic quality gear. It's what supports the channel. It's what supports our activities. Um, like I say, it, it's brilliant quality stuff. It's all. It's a website I run myself. Um, so it, it, it's myself that you're supporting. If you like what I'm doing, uh, then make sure you're shopping at Kendo Star. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think that's it. I'll uh, speak to you again next time.